Our theme for this month has been broken and blessed. We all go through brokenness, but God turns that into blessing when we follow Jesus. Today is that story. Broken, Jesus was broken in the crucifixion. And then on this third day, Easter Sunday, he rose from the dead, he overcame it all. Broken and blessed, sown in dishonor, raised in glory. And part of what we hope to discuss today is the new you. Because of what Jesus did, you can be new. You can be a new you because of the resurrection setting us free from our old who we were. Yogi Berra, does that name sound familiar to you? If you're a sports fan, he was a New York Yankee. He was a catcher for the New York Yankees back in the day. Yogi Berra was known for his crazy sayings. They called them Yogi Berra-isms, like he would say stuff that's just funny in the way he thought and the way that he would talk about things. So here's some of Yogi Berra's comments. You better cut the pizza in four pieces. I'm not hungry enough to eat eight. <laughs> I know. Like, it just has to sink in, sink in. Yogi said, I knew exactly where it was. I just couldn't find it. Yogi said, we're lost, but we're making great time. He said, if you come to a fork in the road, take it. Yogi said, I knew I was going to take the wrong train, so I left early. And probably the thing he was most famous for, he said, it ain't over till it's over. In baseball, that had a profound impact. It ain't over till it's over. There's nine innings and there's three outs in every inning and it could be two outs in the ninth inning if you're behind, it ain't over till it's over. They keep playing until the last out. It ain't over till it's over and that's actually what catches my attention for today. On Friday, the followers of Jesus thought it was over. It seemed like their hopes were dashed. Jesus died. There wasn't a soul around that was thinking, expecting the resurrection. Even though Jesus said it would happen, he predicted this was what would come. They were still thinking they were following a Messiah that was going to set them up to rule in Jerusalem. And then that didn't come about. It looked like it was over to them. Yet it wasn't over and Jesus wasn't done yet. He was about to turn what appeared to be the worst defeat of all time into the greatest victory of all time. Jesus, in essence, was saying it ain't over until it's over. His actual words were, it is finished. When I read that this week, one of the things that struck me was he did not say, I am finished. He said, it is finished. He finished the task of redeeming mankind from sin. He accomplished what he came for. He said that it is finished and he bowed his head and died. It was finished, but Jesus was just getting started. He did not say, I am finished. It ain't over until it's over. What was finished was the sacrifice is paid. It's done now for all time. Here we are today and you don't have to have anything else happen for you to have complete and total victory. It is finished. Jesus, however, is alive. Jesus was just getting started where in just the third day from this point of death, he was going to be raised from the dead and he lives forever. He lives today and he's making prayers for us, praying for us that we would know him. He rose from the dead. I want to read some of this resurrection impact from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The Apostle Paul is describing it for the people that he was talking to in that day. People that weren't very far removed from the death and resurrection of Jesus. As you read this, I want to give just one brief explanation before we get into the reading of it. You'll find here he's talking in the middle of it about two atoms. He references one Adam, 
who is created from the dust of the earth. He's talking about the first Adam, the first man that God made. He formed him from the dust of the earth. He breathed the breath of life in him. He then references a second Adam. Jesus was born into this world without sin. The first Adam was born, created into this world without sin. And then as we know the story of Genesis chapter three, we see how Adam and Eve gave in to the devil's lies and they sinned and it brought death into the world. So everyone born of Adam after that, you and me, we're born with a nature to sin. We have a lot of good in us, but we have some sin in us that we, that we act out and it needs to be paid for. And it required a blood sacrifice. In the Old Testament, they killed lambs, actually, innocent lambs, and spilled the blood on the altars in order to have a sacrifice that would be offered to cover the sins of the people. All looking forward to the second Adam, Jesus, who was born without sin because the seed was planted in a virgin woman's womb, Mary. She hadn't known a man, and so there's no bloodline of mankind in the blood of Jesus. It was the seed planted by God supernaturally when he's born of this natural birth process, he still had heavenly blood in him. We see that the Bible says he was tempted like we are, but he never gave into it. So the first Adam brought sin, the second Adam paid for it. And we'll read about that here. I just wanted to give that background before, hopefully it will make sense as we read it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 42. So is it with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. When Jesus died on the cross, that was a very shameful way to die. As we read about and learn about the history of crucifixion, it was the worst sentence anyone could ever receive. People looked on that person as having the worst of shame that they're dying for. And here Jesus is sown in dishonor, but then raised in glory. The dishonor that he paid for was my dishonor. Now I don't have to walk in dishonor because I can receive the glory that he provides. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Here the apostle Paul gives us a gospel story quite succinctly. We are born of the natural man and we bear that nature. We have sin, we know we have. But now we can be born again of the second man, Adam, Jesus, who overcame sin and when he was raised from the dead, he says to you and me, all we have to do is trust in him and he's paid for our sins. My shame is removed from me as it was placed on him. And now I identify with him in his resurrection power. I now bear the image of the man of heaven. No one offers to anyone in this world what Jesus offers. No one else can do that. There's lots of other religions. There's a lot of good philosophies. There's a lot of good attempts to try to bring hope and meaning to the world. But there's only one person that has offered to do for you and for me what Jesus offered to do. There was only one perfect 
sacrifice, Jesus being that one, where he did not sin, yet he chose to take my sin on himself and pay for it in that moment. He became sin for me, was buried in a grave, but then rose from it, overcame my sin, overcame hell, overcame the grave. He offers to me perfection. Jesus reconnects us to his nature of perfection. This is the hope of Easter. This is what we celebrate today. We walk in here, who knows with what we're carrying. Who knows how you feel. You don't know how I feel. We're all walking with the circumstances of life that we're walking through. But we come in here with one common factor is that Jesus is able to plant his image and place his image upon you and upon me. And we're all seen by the Father in heaven as perfect because we bear the image of his son who died on the cross but then rose from the dead and overcame that all and says, I'm going to put my image on you. That's why I'm here today to celebrate what Jesus has done for me. The ultimate answer, according to those who followed Jesus, is the vacated tomb. How do we know that Jesus is for real? How do we know that he knows what he's talking about. There were people who saw that the tomb was empty. They knew he went in it. The stone was rolled over the entrance to it. There were guards guarding it so that nothing nefarious would happen. And then in one moment in time, the earth begins to shake. The stone is rolled away. The guards are freaking out because they think they're going to be in trouble for allowing Jesus to escape or someone to take him. They can't figure out what's going on. They come to see that the tomb is empty and then Jesus appears to people. Listen to this still in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians verse 3. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the 12. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive. Paul is writing not long after the death and resurrection of Jesus and is talking about over 500 people that not only heard what he talked about, but saw that what he said he would do, he did. He appeared in his resurrected bodily form to over 500 people who are, many of them, still alive at the time of Paul's writing. This is not some kind of fable. This is not some story somebody came up with that we're trying to get tricked into believing. This is history. This is real. This is what Paul is saying I'm telling you about the one who we have seen, the one who many saw in his resurrected form before he ascended back to heaven and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that that was him. They saw the nail prints in his hands and his feet like he appeared to his disciples and doubting Thomas still was doubting. How could this be him when Jesus says, well, go ahead and touch the nail prints in my hands, my feet, touch the spot in my side where the sword pierced me through. And Thomas does so, and he sees that this is Jesus. There was no doubt that what he said was true. Yeah, it's so far out of the box, it would be hard to believe except that it happened. It would be hard to believe except that he's supernatural, that he's God, and that he's able to do all these things. And we have this testimony. This, this is not made up. This is not something we're trying to grapple with by, by some distant philosopher. These are eyewitnesses. And that eyewitness testimony is passed on to us to here we are today. Can Jesus actually replace death with life? He did a convincing job with his own. We can trust Jesus because he has been there. He walked in our shoes. Jesus was in Bethlehem. He walked this earth. He was born wearing, they put on him rags, 
wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. He's in a, a barn environment. He was born into this world to the sound of farm animals bustling around, to the smell of it. Jesus has been there, been where we've been. He's been shivering against the cold. All of divinity content to be contained in an eight pound body. How does a son of God who's existed for all of eternity condense himself to an eight pound baby? First of all, to a seed planted into the egg of a virgin woman's womb, to go through the gestational period of nine months, to then be born in a natural way into this world, and this is God. Why am I saying this? Because he's been where I've been. He's been where you've been. I don't remember being a baby, but I know I was one. <laughs> I've seen babies born. Three of them, Kathy and I, she gave birth to you. I was there to welcome them into the world. It was a pretty awesome, pretty amazing moment in time. I've been at least in the hospital when the grandkids were born. They wouldn't let me in the room for those. I didn't want to be. I shouldn't say they wouldn't let me. It's like, that's okay. I'll wait out here. But then when they've got them all cleaned up, it's like, man, I'm ready to see these little ones. Now they're not so little. We've all been there. You know what? Jesus has been there. Jesus has been where you've been. He's been homeless. Jesus has been hungry. He's been weary. Jesus has been betrayed. All the things that you've experienced in your life, the good, the bad, the beautiful, the ugly, he's experienced it. And then he chose to take all of our sins, the worst of us, the worst of all of us on himself when he died on the cross. Jesus has been there. He has been us. And now he says, you can be me. I'll give you my glory. I will give you my image. All you have to do is accept the sacrifice I paid for you and that shame is off of you. I took it already. You don't have to walk in shame. Offload it. Let go of it. You don't have to have one more day of feeling guilt and the shame of whatever has gone on in your journey. Give it up. Jesus paid for it. Take on his image and now he'll help us to grow into his likeness and living out the life that he's called us to. It can become really exciting when we walk after him. He's been to the grave, not as a visitor, but as a corpse, buried amidst others, numbered among the dead. His heart stopped beating. His lungs stopped filling with air. His body was wrapped and the grave was sealed. The cemetery. He's been buried there. You haven't yet, but you will be. I haven't yet, but I will be. There are occasions that I'll find my way to the cemetery just off of Greenback Avenue in Sunrise. My dad is buried there. I've been to that cemetery because my dad's body is there. And I think about it and know that Jesus has been there too. He's been buried. He's been in the tomb. But here's the difference. He didn't stay there and neither will you. And neither will I. Jesus knows the way out of the grave. He knows the way out. He knows how to get you out. How do people ever find their way out of a six foot under the ground grave and a casket and whatever else they do to you? How do you get out of that? Jesus knows how. He's already done it. And he says, I'm going to show you the way too. I'm going to give you everlasting life. You will have new life. You will have a new body. 
We are sown in dishonor. We are raised in glory. The dishonor of our sinfulness is all past and gone and dead to us. Now we are alive to God and Jesus is alive in us and he's going to show us the way. That's what Easter's all about. Because Jesus rose from the dead, we have hope. We have salvation, victory, and purpose. What does salvation even mean? What? I'm saved. I'm saved from death. I'm saved from hell. I'm saved from separation from God. I'm saved from loneliness. I'm saved from being overwhelmed with shame. I'm saved from all of that by what Jesus did for me. He paid for it, and instead he gives me hope, victory, purpose. Verse 20 of 1 Corinthians 15, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, meaning died. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. He's talking again about by a man, Adam's sinfulness, death is pronounced over all mankind. But by another man's righteousness, Death is overcome and we are offered resurrection by identifying with his resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all be made, shall be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. And there's the question of the day. Those who belong to Christ. Who do you belong to? Do you belong to Christ? You can answer that question really simply by believing in him. You belong to him when you believe that he is. You belong to him when it makes sense in your mind, when really God, by his spirit, gives us understanding. I would be praying for that all the time. God, help me to understand what's true. Help me to understand you. And the Holy Spirit will give us the ability to see that this is true, this is real, that Jesus is and that he died for me and that he rose for me and he's offering me eternal life. And I believe in him and because of that, I belong to him. And because I belong to him, he is going to raise me out of my grave to everlasting life. He will do that for everyone who belongs to him. We will be given imperishable, immortal, and spiritual bodies. Be confident today in your faith because of what Jesus has done. I'm not confident in my abilities. I'm confident in his. That's what gives me hope. Like I'm too overwhelmed at times by my inabilities. What I need to do is get overwhelmed by his abilities. That he is greater than my weakness. He will give me what I need. He will give me wisdom. He will give me talents. He will give me the ability to achieve things I never dreamed possible. When I connect my life to him, suddenly his image is placed on me and what he makes available to me is hard to even fathom. First Peter verse, chapter one and verse three. Blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. He is keeping all of this for us when we believe in his resurrection. The act of God dwelling in man, it separates Christianity from every other religion in the world. God comes to live in us. Roman soldiers, government seals, Large stones could not prevent Jesus from accomplishing his mission. He overcame sin, death, held the grave. Easter brings hope, new beginnings, eternal life. We receive a new identity and share in Jesus' indestructible life. The new you. You have a new identity and you share in Jesus' indestructible life. This gives us new confidence that we can make it in the day we're living right now. Colossians 3 verse 1, if then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. 
For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You have died, meaning your old life is dead and you are now hidden alive with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Jesus is now your life. Jesus is now my life. He lives in me. He came to set me free. He came to do all this for me. He came to do all this for you. When we come to realize this, wow, we're all of the same make. We're all of the same model. We have his grace that has covered our sins. We have his shed blood that renews us and gives us a blood transfusion. We are now perfected and we have his perfection in us, living through us, and we will appear with him in glory. Your true identity as a child of God is hidden with Christ in God, and it will be manifest. It will be seen in spectacular glory at his coming. Sown in dishonor, raised in glory. This is our Christian privilege. The risen Christ is in us, with us as our friend. He is our helper all the time, all the way from here to heaven. He will not allow interruptions in the relationship that we have with him. Even when we stumble, even when we goof up, even when we still sin, even when we get messed up in our mind and things happen to us and we lose our way, it seems, in our own mind. God says, if you have put your faith in me, in my son Jesus, you are mine and you are mine forever. Stay connected. He is with you. He will help you. His grace covers you. You are new. And his mercies are new every morning, every single morning. It's an opportunity for us on this Easter Sunday to be free, not to be worried about what we did last week or what we did last night, but to be thankful for what we did this morning that we trusted in Jesus as our Savior. We said, I believe in you. I thank you for what you did. Thank you for going before me and living life that I've lived, but overcoming it and giving me the hope of heaven, giving me the hope of being with you forever. And I can live with you in the battles of this world. And there are many, there are things that are going on every day that are really confusing. Things that are going on today that are very discouraging. Things that are going on today that are hard for us to grasp and understand. I get all that, but God gets all that too. He knows how hard it is for us to understand eternal things when we're living in this finite world. But he also knows that he'll see us through it if we just hold on, hold on to him, if we believe in him, if we put our trust in him, he will make things turn around. He will cause the confusion to make sense in time. I'm believing in him with all my heart today. And the passion I have in my heart is that you will too. I know many of you have. I'm just trusting someone else today is going to make that decision. How about you? Where are you at? Do you belong to him? If you belong to him, you're, you're good to go. He'll show you the way out. None of us know the way out, but Jesus does. And he'll show you the way out. I'm believing that for those that are attending online today. I actually feel in my heart such a desire for everyone here that we're all together sharing this moment. But beyond this, there's so many people that aren't still connecting. Like here we are, Easter Sunday is, is the most attended church day in the calendar year. It's that way across the city. It's exciting. But you know how many people didn't go today? Thousands, millions. And that's also where my heart's at. It's like, man, could they hear this message somehow? Could, could we tell people about this that we've understood, that we've come to grips with? Let's keep telling people about Jesus. That's what we're here for now is to let this message spread. We're here to let somebody know this week that it's opportunity to have hope. It's an opportunity to have someone show us the way out of the grave. Jesus knows the way. He's already been there. He's already proved it. 
Father God, we trust you today in this moment for revelation. I pray that you would bring that about, revelation of who you are and that we would make decisions in this moment to believe in you, to receive you. I pray that would happen over and again. If you want to make that decision, just pray with me. Jesus, I believe in you. I put my trust in you right now. I know that I have sinned and I ask you to forgive me. Thank you for paying for my sins. Thank you for that. And I accept the gift that you've offered to make me new, to give me a new identity, to make me a new me. I accept that gift today by faith in Jesus' name. Amen.